Hello and welcome to the Three Minute Thesis Competition. I'm Jim Vandeven, a professor of mechanical engineering, also the director of graduate studies, and so it's my great pleasure to serve as the MC for tonight's event. So first of all, what is the Three Minute Thesis Competition? Uh, so the Three Minute Thesis Competition is just as it sounds. Students are presenting the work that would be in their PhD or master's thesis in three minutes, 180 seconds. And so they're taking a huge amount of very technical information, distilling it down into something that can be shared in a very you know, interesting and um, you know, communicable, uh, you know, bite-sized piece, which would otherwise be in a 150 or 200 page thesis. So that is what we're going to get to hear tonight. So the purpose of the three minute thesis, next slide please. The purpose of the three minute thesis is to really celebrate all the exciting research that is going on in the mechanical engineering department without you having to read that 150 page thesis or read the journal papers that would come out of the work. So otherwise a lot of this research would not be you know, communicated in the same way. This is a great way for us to all hear about it. But also for the students, it is a great way for them to practice their presentation skills. And simultaneously, we are video recording all of this such that these students have this in posterity for, for the future. So right now in the audience, we have pro approximately one third of our total audience. The other two thirds is online tonight. So a very good turnout for tonight's event. So not only is this a chance to present, but it's also a chance to win some cash awards. And we have three judges that I'll be introducing in just a moment. Those three judges will be voting on both the first and the second place awards. And then you as our audience will be voting on the People's Choice Awards. And again, cash, cash prizes for all of these. So let me go ahead and introduce our judges for tonight. So our first judge is Carla uh, Pavone. She is the uh, program director and co-PI of MinCorps. Welcome. Second, we have Kathleen Stenerson from Medtronic. She is a senior director in, of research and development. And third, we have Ching-Hui Yuan, who is the uh, director of modeling and data science at Donaldson. Thank you. All right, so also I'm very happy to say that this program tonight is hosted by the ME Advisory Council. And so, first of all, the members of our ME Advisory Council, they are very valuable to our department in terms of providing guidance, support, and really a place for us to, to get feedback as well as interact with our students in a whole variety of ways from sponsoring capstone design projects to um, guiding our students in career services and, and a whole variety of, of things. So here are the companies that are actively involved in our MEAC currently. And at this time, I would like to in, uh, introduce one of our members of the MEAC who's going to say a couple of words. So next slide, please. Uh, Steve Hubbard, if you'd be willing to come up and say a couple of words. Steve is the Vice President of Engineering and R&D at Tenant Corporation, or Tenant Company. Steve. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Welcome. A lot of excitement in the room. Love to see that. So uh, yeah, just on behalf of the ME Advisory Council, our purpose is to really cultivate a strong relationship between our local Minnesota industries and the, the ME department here, but also to cultivate a strong relationship with the students. And so we'll see events just like this one, as well as uh, fall career prep and spring, uh, uh, spring event student engagement events as well. And uh, this event here has actually quickly become my favorite. So I've actually been seeing this every year for the past three years and really uh, respect the, the the work that you students are doing to distill really complex topics down to three minutes and in layman's language. Uh, believe it or not, that's a skill you're going to need out in industry as well and something that uh, we have to practice every day. So uh, with that, I'm going to get out of the way and look forward to hearing from you guys. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Steve. So let me give you now an agenda for tonight's event. So we're going to start off with a presentation of quickly what the rules are for the event, what the judging criteria are, and then I'm going to take just a moment to introduce last year's winner of the 2020 Three Minute Thesis competition, who can tell us a little bit about his experiences. Then we'll move on to the main event of the 13 Three Minute Thesis uh, presentations that we'll have tonight. 
You as the audience will then have a chance to vote in terms of the People's Choice Award. As that is happening, also our judges will be deliberating, so we'll take a, a short break there. We'll then come back, announce the winners, and then we'll have a, an informal uh, networking session at the end. So let me move on to the, to the rules. So the rules are quite simple in that the students are allowed only one slide, and that slide must be static, meaning that there's no animations, no videos, none of that. So one static slide to help support their message, their three-minute uh, presentation. They're allowed 180 seconds maximum, and so you'll see that there will be a timer up on the lower left of the, the slides once they, they start presenting. That begins when they start speaking and ends when they, when they stop speaking. So they need to stay within that three minutes. Unfortunately, the students are not able to sing or rap for you tonight. This is a, a spoken word only event. Um, and the, the judge's decision is final. So a fairly simple set of rules for tonight. Now, what are the judges evaluating the students on? So the criterion here are really four main areas within subtopics. So comprehension, content, engagement, and communication. And you can see within each of those, we break them down a little bit more so that we can talk about, were they able to distill this into to layman's terms and emphasize the societal impact of their work? Were they able to do this in an engaging way and so forth? So these are the criteria that our judges will be using. You, in terms of selecting the People's Choice Award, are welcome to use these or your own version of these in, in terms of your evaluation of the, the presentations tonight. All right. so. Without any further ado, well, let me pause one more time. Um, let me introduce our 2020 Three Minute Thesis competition winner. Daniel Thomas uh, gave a great presentation last year on um, green ammonia fuel. His advisor is Will Northrup, and I want to invite him up to the podium for just a moment to, first of all, tell us a little bit about what it's like to deliver a Three Minute Thesis winning presentation and also, what's in it for the student? What, what are the benefits from the student perspective? So Daniel, would you mind taking a moment to explain your, your experience? Sure. Thanks. Yeah, it's good to be with you tonight. Um, for me, the, really the hardest part of the, of the three-minute thesis was not summarizing the material, but um, expressing it in, in words that anyone could understand. Um, the technical jargon that we live in is as scientists and engineers, isn't just words we use to express what we're, what we're talking about, it's, it's really how we think about it. And so, so you trying to communicate this in, in non-technical um, language is really involved rethinking what I, what I did, um, rethinking my work. And that was an iterative thing. I had to do it again and again as I presented to non-technical family and friends, and they said, I don't understand this, and I had to redo it. And by the time I finished, I think what I ended up with was n nothing like what I, my first draft. Um, in terms of benefits, the immediate benefit was that all of a sudden, the number of people who understood the main point of my research jumped by a factor of 10. <laughs> my family especially was delighted to finally understand what I was working on. Um, but it really led to a lot of helpful conversations here within the department with other students and, and colleagues. Um, but I think really the, the main benefit to students is just that, the, what the, the challenge really, learning how to express what we're doing in, in a way that anyone can understand. And that's such a, such a valuable lesson for, for all of life and work. So I'm glad to be here and look forward to hearing hearing this year's presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Yes, and it was a, was a great presentation last year. All right, so let's move on to tonight's event. We do have 13 competitors tonight. Uh, these will all be live presentations. And again, half of our audience is here in the studio and half of them are attending uh, virtually. Uh, we do have uh, two of our winners tonight that will be continuing on to the college level competition. So not only are these cash awards, but there's levels of competition to move on to. And again, remember that you will be voting for the, the People's Choice Award after this event. All right, so let's go ahead and introduce our first speaker tonight. Our first speaker is Marin AP, and the title of her talk is How to Mitigate Volcanic Disasters. Marin?
So uh, I'm Marin. Hi. Um, a very dangerous type of a volcanic flow that uh, takes with its volcanic matter big rocks and ashes with it is called pyroclastic flow. And that can be very dangerous because the speeds of these kind of flow is like hundreds of miles per hour. And um, for uh, this flow, you could imagine that it can uh, wipe out anything on its way. In fact, in 79 AD, uh, it wiped out two of the big cities of Roman Empire completely. So that's fierce, I guess. Um, so what can we, um, what do we know uh, about this flows? So here we have a magmatic fluid and uh, we have the particles. So it's not just a pure fluid. There is these particles, big rocks, which make it a suspension or a particulate suspension. And my research is interested in such kind of fast moving particulate suspensions. And one concern when I talked about it being scary is that can we predict the path uh, which it will take, the volcanic fluid would take, such that we can uh, reduce the casualties, right? So um, the one way is to mod give a model for this kind of flows. But for the pure fluid, it is very easy. But with these kind of fluids where there is particle and a fluid, which is a suspension, there is not much research going into the heat transfer properties of such flows. So I am talking about that. And here, the heat transfer, why am I interested in the volcanic flow? Well, how does it relate? So to know how far it moves, I can say that the solidification of a volcanic flow would be related to its a cooling rate, right? So that's where I bring my topic, the heat transfer in the suspension flows. For that, I am using two concentric cylinders and have the fluid in the gap moving. And this is moved by uh, the outer cylinder is in very high speed rotation and the inner cylinder is at um, is stationary. So how can um, that motion be translated is as shown here. Um, like uh, radially the velocity out of the outside is higher. And with particles injected into that fluid, we would see now that there is a lot of disturbance created or eddies created, which will make a uniform uniformity in the temperature, and that's it. Thank you, Marin. Great job. All right, so moving on to our second presentation tonight. Andrew Allegria will be presenting on reimagining microinjection. Andrew? Okay. Uh, so I'm Andrew. And so when we first think about fruit flies, what do we think about? They're, how they're so pesky, right? How they're always in our garbage cans, how they're always in our sinks, and we can just never seem to get them to go away. But I'm here to tell you that they're actually an extremely important organism that biologists study every day through a process called microinjection. They've even been used to study viruses such as coronavirus. But the way that they study this is through microinjection, like I said, to alter the genome of the fruit fly. So microinjection is a process where you use an extremely fine needle tip and try to inject that into Excellent. a microscopically small uh, embryo um, and then inject an extremely small amount of DNA into that embryo. So as you can imagine, this is an extremely tedious and uh, uh, hard procedure that involves many preparatory steps that uh, technicians have to, very highly skilled technicians have to do. So it's, it really creates a bottleneck when trying to study this organism. So what we wanted to do was try and reimagine this procedure by trying to make it as simple as possible so that a robot would be able to do it. To do this, we use various machine learning and computer vision algorithms to try to automate this procedure as well as optics and robotics components. So it's very helpful to think of this in terms of a human where the body is the optics and robotics components which help the robot to move around and do the injections and the brain are the algorithms. Now these algorithms help us to figure out exactly where all the embryos are on a given petri dish and also once we've done that figure out where exactly we have to inject all of these embryos. 
So the fact that we can do this helps us to eliminate many of the preparatory steps and tedious steps that the highly skilled technicians have to do to do these injections. And all you need for the robot is just an overseer to hit run, and then you can view the injections. So uh, when we compare this to, in, to injection technicians in terms of results, we were able to show that we can get fruit flies with gl glowing green eyes and a glowing green thorax, which signals that we had uh, successful transgenesis, which means we had a good injection. Um, and also when we compare the speed of this robot to the technicians, we were able to show that this robot can perform more than two times faster than the technician, but also still maintain survival and transgenesis success rates similar to that of the, of the technician. So we believe that this robot can do normal manual microinjection experiments. But beyond that, we think that this robot is capable of doing experiments at a scale that has never been done before. And as a result, this will enable us to figure out new, new discoveries about the fruit fly and potentially link this to humans because of the disease genes that humans have that are similar to the fruit fly. So for example, take an experiment where you'd like to figure out, you'd like to test the effects of a certain disease on a particular gene in the fruit fly that's related to humans. This will involve tens of thousands of injections that uh, you know, will take months and months for uh, a manual microinjection technician to, to do. But for the robot, you'll only need to do this for a few days. This is why we reimagine microinjection. Thank you, Andrew. Great job. All right. Our next presentation is going to be Wei Chi Chen, and the title of his talk is Using Aerosols to Create Nanoscale Membranes to Boost Particulate Filter Performance. Wei Chi. Good evening, everyone. My name is Wei Chi Chen, and today I'm going to talk about a technology that can make our environment cleaner and safer. Have you guys ever wondering what is the black smoke that coming out from the vehicle exhaust? Uh, like, uh, what, and what does it do? And those, those, uh, those part, those are the solid particle consists of significant fraction of the agglomerate, uh, agglomerated elemental carbon result from the incomplete combustion, and which is commonly known as the soup particle. And they are the leading cause of the. They are the leading cause of the cancer, respiratory disease, cardiovascular disease, and uh, because the, those particles small enough can be uh, inhaled into our lungs. In the meanwhile, the Warfel honeycomb uh, particle filter that you show this slide here has been universally accepted as an efficient method to, for the engine uh, emission control. Until recent year, the market penetration of the direct gasoline direct injection engine has drastically increased because of their higher fuel efficiency. However, those new engines, they produce much higher uh, level of the soot emissions. Even with the particle filter, uh, they still may not meet the emission regulation. So how do we solve these issues? A simple answer would be uh, to improve the filter performance. Yes, but how? My thesis, and here my thesis is exploring the possibility of using an artificial aerosol to create the nanoscale membrane in the filter uh, to modify the microstructure of the filter microstructure to Im improve the performance. This is a challenging process because uh, the performance of the, the nanoscale membrane is influenced, influenced by many factors. So, and therefore my thesis evaluates uh, the, how the choice of the membrane loading condition, the filter microstructures, uh, the characteristic of the particle that used to form the membrane, how those factors will influence the, the membrane quality. And here, the figure in the blue section here is, demonstra is demonstrating a case that we successfully improved the filter performance with the membrane uh, coded. And furthermore, with the observation and knowledge of, uh, and knowledge from the experiment, we can use uh, those knowledge to establish, establish uh, a new uh, a filter loading model to predict the performance of this membrane filter design. And in, in summary, my thesis will produce a prototype of a membrane incorporated particle filter with two times or three times better performance and an advanced filter loading model that would provide a, a mean of optimization. And we are almost there. Thank you.
Excellent job. Our next presenter will be uh, Joe Kegnes. Um, uh, Kegnes, yeah, and uh, his talk is Preserving Life by Transformation to Glass. I apologize for butchering your name. Joe. So we face an unfortunate fact. So we're in the midst of the sixth mass extinction. And despite the vast array of technology we have at our disposal, we really can't do anything to prevent all the endangered species from going extinct in the animal kingdom. But what if we can buy some time? So my name's Joe Kangas, and my research is in crowd preservation. So we have one main goal, and that's to preserve animal species at the embryonic stage, because at this point, they're so small and malleable that we can actually store them and crowd preserve them. But how do we go about doing this? You can't simply put an embryo in the freezer because ice will form and that'll rip the cell apart. Ice is incredibly damaging. But what if we can prevent ice from forming in the first place? It turns out that if we infuse special chemicals called cryoprotectants and then plunge these embryos into liquid nitrogen, they cool down so fast that water doesn't have time to reorient itself and form ice, transforming it into this new type of substance. It's a different phase of matter called glass. In this state, there's no molecular motion at all. Chemical reactions cease. It's effectively like the whole thing is frozen in time because it really is. And at this point, storage times are infinite. So it provides like the best opportunity for preservation. So once they're in this state, you can hold them indefinitely, but you have to get them warmed up eventually. So what we do, we have to warm them really fast because ice tends to form really quickly on rewarming. So we infuse them with nanoparticles as well as crap protectants, and then shoot them with a laser. And this heats them up at millions of degrees per minute. And again, outpaces the reformation of ice. And we've turned, we have actually validated this on several different species. We we're able to crowd preserve coral and rewarm them. They're one of the most endangered species that we know of in the ocean. And we also did for zebrafish embryos, which are uh, a model organism for all types of genetic research and aquatic organisms. So the idea is to, would be to extend this research into basically the rest of the animal kingdom. So we would like to take all the animal species that are endangered, and we could feasibly do this and cryopreserve preserve their embryos and put them in some sort of banking facility. So this would be like an animal biodiversity bank, um, similar to the Svalbard Plant Global Biodiversity Bank, which houses much of the world's plant and agricultural seeds in Norway. So the main technological challenges for this include finding the right crowd protectant and finding a way to engineer cooling and warming rates so that they're really rapid but also really uniform. And by using this technology, we can help buy some time to preserve the endangered species that we have right now so that once we fix all the damage we've done to our environment, we can uh, bring them back and reintroduce them. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Great job. All right. Our next presenter for tonight is going to be Ami Joshi, and he'll be presenting Robots to Accelerate Biological Research. As a scientist, we want to study human body, cure diseases, and make human lives better. Let's say we want to develop some new drug, like COVID vaccine. We want that drug as soon as possible. But developing a drug, testing it, bringing it to the market, it's a long process. It takes time. Also, in the beginning phase of the drug development, we can't even test these drugs on human. That's why we turn towards model organisms. There are several model organisms, like monkeys, mice, zebrafish, and even small, tiny fruit flies. These model organisms help us to understand the, how these drugs will affect the human body. And that's how we, we develop the drugs. These model organisms actually help us to understand how gene expression, gene structure will affect the human body. But to do all of that, scientists need to introduce small amount of substance into the small cells of these model organisms at their embryonic stage. And that's where microinjection comes into picture. Microinjection is a technique which helps us to do so by using small, tiny pipette. It's a technique which is similar to any other injection technique but at microscopic level. And 
it requires, that's why operator requires high level of skills and hundreds of hours of practice to master it. Robots. Robots has always enabled human to automate such a hard critical techniques which requires high level of precision and hundreds of hours of practice to master it. In my research, I am developing one such robot which automates the whole microinjection procedure. This robot is built of off-the-shelf, commonly, commonly used components which can be easily found. This robot contains a series of cameras to locate the embryo at the center and based on that imaging technique, computer vision detects where the embryo is and where the injection needs to be performed. Based on that data, robot finally performs the microinjection. This robot allows us the degree of control and precision in all aspects of the process which would have been impossible to do manually. One cool thing about this robot is it is so generalized that by adding a small amount of data and training model, this robot can be used for any other model organisms. That's why I think this robot can be used for large-scale experiments. I hope this robot will open up the research opportunities that have been never explored before. If this robot leads to accelerating biological research by one day and save one human life, then I would say I'll be the happiest person on that day. Thank you. Great presentation, thank you. All right. Our next presentation for this evening is Yaling Liu, and her presentation is Transparent Solar Panel Luminescent Solar Concentrator. The Earth is hit with 173,000 terawatts of energy from the sun continuously. That's 10,000 times more power than the entire world consumes. To utilize it, one of the most commonly used technology is solar photovoltaics. Solar panel systems for homes and businesses are increasing rapidly in popularity. However, what about applying solar panels for greenhouses? Imagine a greenhouse with solar panels covering nearly all over the roof. Plants inside would cry because solar panels cannot let light, let, let light in. To solve this problem, our research group is working on transparent solar panels luminescent solar concentrators. How can they be transparent? Let's start with their mechanism. Luminescent solar concentrator we are working on are large glasses coated with nanocrystal polymer composites. These nanocrystals called quantum dots can absorb part of shorter wavelength of sunlight while letting the rest pass through. These quantum dots then re-emit the luminescence in longer wavelength which are guided along with the glass to the peripheral solar cell that convert them into electricity. My work is to synthesize silicon quantum dots, fabricate silicon quantum dot luminescent solar concentrators, and evaluate their efficiency. Using our recipe, we found silicon luminescent solar concentrator can achieve a pretty low levelized cost of energy, only 1.6 cents per kilowatt hour. Now, Let's return to the plants in greenhouses. Researchers show that blue light will inhibit plant cell elongation, which makes plants unhappy, while the red light is required for plant growth. So having a tunable transmission spectrum is beneficial for the greenhouse application. To achieve it, we collaborated with Dr. Vivian's group, added another coating layer with camiocinite camiosulfide sulfide quantum dots onto the silicon quantum dots coating layer. Because different quantum dots have different absorption spectrum, this bilayer luminescent solar concentrator has a strong ability to control the sunlight spectrum passing through it. After our efforts, plants would smile in a solar-powered greenhouse. Hopefully, in the future, luminescent solar concentrator roof will be widely applied for greenhouses, not only generating clean energy, but also increasing crop yield. I'm looking forward to that day. Thank you. Thank you, Lala Yaoling. All right. Our next presentation for the evening is Yilin uh, Leo, and she'll be presenting 
pregnancy test for COVID-19. Thank you, Jim. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused significant global hospitalization and deaths. During the COVID outbreaks, when we need a testing, we usually do the driving through test as shown in the top lab figure. And then we have to go home and wait for many hours or even days to get the test results. The tests provided there are usually RT-PCR, which is highly sensitive. However, the RT-PCR has longer turnaround time and needs for expensive reagents, equipment, and professional personnel. And there are also alternative rapid tests for COVID-19, which are called lateral flow immunoassay, which is very similar to the pregnancy test as shown in the bottom left figure. People can stay at home and do the test themselves, and it only takes about 10 minutes to get the results. These lateral flow immune assays are very cheap, simple, and easy to use. However, they suffer from very low sensitivity, which are many orders of magnitude lower than PCR. To boost the sensitivity of these rapid tests and fill the gap between rapid test and the PCR, my research is to do the ultra-sensitive rapid test for COVID-19. And to achieve these High, ultra high sensitivity. Comprehensive assay optimization was carried out along with signal amplification. With all those efforts, we developed our own advanced lateral flow immune assay as shown in the right figure. We showed comparable sensitivity to RT PCR. And compared with the commercial rapid tests, you will see that this is also many orders of magnitude more sensitive than the PCR. And compared with the PCR itself, our rapid test still has this benefit of simplicity and rapidity. Above all, our advanced lateral flow immune assay can both rapidly and sensitively diagnose COVID-19, which can help release the heavy testing burden of the current pandemic, and also help us better prepared for future pandemics and manage and control other disease. But in the end, I hope no one will need any tasks here, and I hope everyone will live a healthy life. Thank you. Thank you, Yulian. So our, our next presenter is going to be Ali Nuriani, and his presentation is Wearable Analysis of Postural Instability in Parkinson's Disease. Uh, I'm Ali. Hi. My Parkinson's disease patients often, uh, often fall at home, and the risk of falling results in significant loss of qualification. Uh, uh, results in significant lo uh, loss of qualification in their lives. So, in my project, I'm trying to, and also falls are a major source of uh, healthcare costs due to, due to hospitalization. So, in my project, I'm developing a technology to. Uh, monitor these patients at home and help their doctors to uh, t to treat and diagnose their disease uh, more precisely. So to do so, we will give these patients uh, small, lightweight, and inexpensive uh, inertial sensors. And they only need to attach them one on, their, uh, one on each of their uh, lower leg and one on the chest and only charge them every two days. So when, they, uh, when we get back the data after a week from the patients, we need to first uh, identify near falls and stumbles uh, and any unbalanced moments of this patient among all their other daily living activities like sitting, standing, walking, and so on. And when a patient have one of these near fall events, we need to uh, analyze the patient's response. And for that, we need to estimate some walking and balancing variables like their step lengths, their, uh, uh, their number of steps, their reaction time, and the severity of the event. This data helps their doctor to treat them more precisely and char characterize their disease. Uh, 
And well, we will verify this hypothesis in, in the long term that uh, this home monitoring system uh, can be much more uh, uh, accurate in predicting fall risk and it can be much more uh, uh, accurate in characterizing postural instability in Parkinson's disease patients compared to the clinical tests that are currently being used by the doctors. So the contributions of my work is that, uh, well, first I had to, uh, I didn't have, at the beginning, I didn't have enough data for training machine learning methods. So I've developed a novel system identification based for activity recognition, which re requires much less data. And then uh, because I needed to estimate those uh, walking and balancing variables and the underlying dynamics of uh, human body is nonlinear, I had to, develop some nonlinear estimation algorithms. And I've also shown that those estimates can be used in state-of-the-art deep learning uh, methods for activity recognition and improve their accuracy. Uh, an additional outcome of my research is that I uh, will collect a large and valuable data set of PD cases at home. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. All right, our next presenter for this evening is Yaroslav uh, Makhnenko. His presentation is Don't Let Pesticides Fly Away. In May 2013, an airplane sprayed pesticides over farms in a village in Brazil. Kids from a nearby school inhaled a large portion of these pesticides and were immediately hospitalized due to pesticide poisoning. Pesticides provide plants with nutrients protect them from insects, but have serious implications on human lives. Scientists have linked pesticides with cancer, Alzheimer's disease, and ADHD. If the size of the pesticide droplet is too small, they get carried away for several miles under strong winds. This phenomenon is called pesticide spray drift. Over 30% of the complaints received by the Minnesota Department of Agriculture are against spray drift. Although there are regulations in place, a lot of these complaints are closed due to lack of evidence. So one could easily get away with spray drift. The complex fluids and multiphase flow lab at the University of Minnesota is conducting research to tackle this issue of pesticide spray drift and protect human lives. A study shows that over 90% of pesticide spray do not reach the crops. If the size of a droplet is small, they travel long distances causing spray drift. On the other hand, large droplets bounce off the leaves and do not benefit the crops. My research focuses on techniques to control the droplet size distribution. The droplet size should be maintained between 100 to 400 microns. Lower than 100 microns means spray drift. Larger than 400 microns means low spray efficacy. To give you a sense of scale, human hair is 75 microns in thickness. We add oil and special chemicals to water and study their effect on spray drift. Using these experiments, we have successfully found a specific combination of this mixture to reduce small droplets and prevent spray drift. In addition to protecting human lives, my research also aims to increase the efficacy of pesticide sprays to improve plant lives. Leaves are not transparent, so we mix fluorescent dye with the pesticides and add these droplets on the leaf surface. We then study the absorption of this colorful drop under a special microscope. I'm confident that my work will contribute to alleviate this global issue, safeguarding human and plant lives. Thank you and have a good day. Nice job, Yaroslav. Our next presentation for the evening is Jeremy Simmons, Fresh Water from Waves. Globally, two thirds of us experience severe water scarcity for at least one month out of the year. And in five years, half of us could be experiencing severe water scarcity full time. Um, there, there are many issues kind of uh, involved with meeting our needs for water. 
but one of those is that uh, 70 or 97 percent of uh, the water on this planet is locked up in our salty oceans. So um, densely populated and drought prone areas like California and Northwest Africa are unable to use that s the seawater without spending a very large amount of energy to separate the water from the salt. At the same time, uh, our oceans carry enough energy to supply a tenth of um, the total energy we consume on this planet in the form of ocean waves. My research is considering using that energy in the ocean waves to power, uh, to, to produce fresh water using a reverse osmosis. Reverse osmosis is an efficient uh, method of desalination. It relies on pressurized flow over a thin membrane. That membrane allows water molecules to pass through but prevents the salt ions from passing. It's efficient, but it requires a lot of energy. Using, um, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, for uh, wave energy, it's very difficult to, um, to drive elect electric generator without uh, incurring a lot of energy losses through intermediate steps. Um, but it is easy to attach a, a pump to a wave-driven device like a buoy or a flap and produce a pressurized flow. So we can couple these two systems relatively easy. A challenge for, the, um, for these systems, though, is that wave energy is highly variable. It's variable in the short term with uh, each wave having essentially random size and variable day to day, month to month, um, with it, the waves uh, generally having um, more or less energy in them. Um, I've, uh, to address the short term variation, I've used, um, I've designed this system a lot like the suspension on your car, where the waves act like bumps in a rough road that you don't really feel in um, inside the vehicle. To address the long-term variation, um, I've used, uh, I've drawn inspiration from the charger for your cell phone, where we can use 120 volts to power a device that runs on three to five. Um, and that's allowed us to really reduce the size and cost of these systems. Um, so with the, the work that I've done to understand the design, uh, we're bringing the costs of the levelized cost of water down at the same time that we're um, bringing that technology forward to deployment. Okay. Thank you, Jeremy. Our next presentation for the evening is Ben Zott, Cost Effective Dialysis for Developing Countries. Ben? People diagnosed with chronic kidney disease have kidneys that can no longer function properly and require dialysis or a kidney transplant to survive. This can be a frightening diagnosis, especially for people in Sub-Saharan Africa, where it is estimated that 88% of people with this diagnosis pass away within just three months of their initial treatment. And oftentimes, transplants in these developing countries are not even available or are too expensive, so dialysis becomes the only option. There are two methods of dialysis. There's hemodialysis, commonly known as HD, and peritoneal dialysis, commonly known as PD. Now, in some countries, such as Nigeria, HD is only available, and this requires expensive machines as well as very expensive imported materials. Therefore, our research team is pushing for peritoneal dialysis, or PD. PD utilizes the, a natural membrane inside the abdomen, and by adding fluid into it, it can exchange and clear out the toxins from the blood. However, in some developing countries, this is just not available. So our research team is working on developing a device that can create that fluid locally to reduce the import cost and to hopefully increase access by lowering the cost of dialysis in general. In order to do that, our device must contain three different modules. We have to create the water for injection, we have to mix those solutes with water, and we have to bag that solution, all without a clean room that we could he use here in the US, as well as by just reducing the overall cost and not using expensive testing materials and equipments and computers. 
My specific research is on that mixing module where I'm trying to verify what you're mixing is proper and correct without that expensive computer and expensive sensors in order to reduce the cost. So I plan on using low cost sensors that can measure the conductivity and I'm working on that correlation to see can it be fully mixed and is that safe to go into the human body. Ultimately, we feel that this push for PD and a localized, low cost production of PD fluid can greatly increase the lives of people that are affected by this horrible disease. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Our next presentation for the evening is Zhang Zi, Vehicle Tracking with Low Cost Sensors. Have you ever wondered how vehicle accidents can be avoided and how traffic flow can be improved? We are working on addressing these from the aspect of vehicle tracking. Vehicle tracking is critical in intelligent transportation applications such as driver assistance systems, autonomous driving, and traffic monitoring. Compared to the high density lidars used on many autonomous vehicles, which can easily cost thousands or tens of thousands of dollars per sensor. Um, the objective here is to use low cost sensors that are one to two orders of magnitude less expensive. Uh, such low cost sensors, for example, low density flash lidars and single chip radars can immediately enable uh, novel applications that improve transportation safety and traffic flow. However, these sensors normally provide very limited information. Uh, in many cases, only a few data points are available to measure from a vehicle. Therefore, new estimation algorithms are needed in order to achieve reasonable vehicle tracking performance from the low-cost sensors. Take the low-density flash LiDAR, for example. We developed a new sensor model that can predict how the LiDAR reflection points on the vehicle will change uh, due to the vehicle's movement. With this, we maximized the information obtained from the vehicle, and smooth tracking was achieved despite the sensor's poor resolution. We have various projects that are based on vehicle tracking using low-cost sensors. We have a smart bicycle that protects itself. In this case, the bicycle tracks nearby vehicles with its onboard sensors, predicts if there's a danger of a collision with the vehicle, and alerts the car driver when necessary. We also have a portable traffic analysis and vehicle counting system, and also in another project, um, intelligent traffic science for work and workers protection and traffic flow control. I believe there are many more possibilities with traffic, uh, with vehicle tr tracking with low-cost sensors. Thank you. Thank you, Zeming. Our final presentation of the evening is Ning Yi. Her presentation title is Understanding How the Orthodontic Aligners Work. If you want to have and keep your good chewing ability and also stay away from those oral diseases due to bacteria accumulation, orthodontic treatment will be a great help. So first of all, we need to understand how the teeth can be moved and aligned. So from the tooth structure shown here, you can see between the tooth and the bone, there's a very thin layer called periodontal ligament, the PDR layer. So this layer plays a very important role in tooth movement. Its structure is just like a sponge, so it can be squeezed and stretched. In orthodontic treatment and in each stage, the dentists are trying not to move the teeth over this thickness of the liner, which is about 0.25 millimeter in average. So in this case, they can protect both the root and bone not to hit each other directly. And after its initial squeezing and stretching of PDL, it can recover to its initial status at the new position. And then the bone remodeling will occur to fit the new geometry. So in that case, the teeth are moved. Traditionally, we use wires and brackets to do the teeth alignment. Before pursuing for aesthetics, the clear tree aligners become more and more popular. But this technique still has some limitations. First of all, we don't have sufficient 
data to prove that it's efficient enough. And also for some types of teeth movement, such as the rotation, extrusion, and overjets, the dentists are not exactly sure that the teeth can be pushed to their final positions they expected. So they are not sure if the force are strong enough or like the amount. So based on all, the, all these problems, we need to find a way to solve them. So our approach is to build a numerical model that can represent the true physical ones. And of course, our model are validated by the real cases. So based on our model, we can easily predict and track the forces and moments during the process by simulating the aligner setting on the teeth. And in this case, we can learn more about its biomechanisms of these aligners and then uh, know the tooth movement they can intru introduce. And the dentist, based on our model, can have a safer and more efficient way to do their design. And also, if we learn more about the PDL and bone remodeling and their influences to the tooth movement, it will be a strong help for current clinical studies. Thanks. Thank you, Ning. Great presentation. And, and before we move on to the voting, I do just want to thank all of our 13 presenters one more time for their great presentations tonight. All right, so the time you've all been waiting for, it's time to pull out your smartphones and uh, please vote for the People's Choice Award. Here is the, the link to go to. And again, everyone is able to, to vote for one individual. We will leave the polls open for five minutes. We'll take roughly an eight to 10 minute break and then we'll be back with the judges' results. So if the judges would please recess and come up with a uh, first and second place winner. Thanks everyone. We'll take five to, or eight to 10 minutes. Hey, can I pull everybody back together, please? <laughs> the people's choice have spoken as well as the judges. So again, thank you to all of our presenters for the evening. So starting off again, the, the cash awards. And let me just first say that what I am going to be handing out tonight are these beautiful plaques. As you'd expect, you know, laser cut for <laughs> mechanical engineers seems about right. They didn't trust me to hold the cash for some reason. So you know, the, the cash prizes, if you jump one slide, please. The three cash prizes for tonight are first place of 250, runner up of $100, and people's choice of $100. And of course, plaques. <laughs> all right, so first of all, the People's Choice Award goes to, drum roll please, <laughs> People's Choice Award goes to Yaroslav Makinenko for Don't Let Pesticides Fly Away. Congratulations. All right, so now moving on to second place. Drum roll, please. Second place is going to be awarded to Yaling Lu, uh, Transparent Solar Panel, Luminescent Solar Concentrator. And the moment you've all been waiting for, the winner of the three-minute thesis competition, drum roll, is Ami Joshi, Robots to Accelerate Biological Research. And again, thank you to all of our presenters tonight. Some wonderful presentations. It was great to get some of the exciting research packed into a small quick presentation that you know, was accessible to, to all of us. So thank you all for, for all your efforts tonight. So this concludes the event, but I encourage you to hang around and go out to our lobby and do some networking, have a chance to, to talk to all these individuals and learn more about the, the work that they're doing. So again, 
Thank you all to our presenters. Thank you to our audience, both here in the studio and um, at home. We really appreciate you coming out and supporting all of our students. Have a good evening.